Many, many moons back, it used to be a ritual with my dad and I that we would go camping at Lake Winnipeg during the summer months at least. During our time there, traveling around there, and traveling to and from, we saw all sorts of crazy stuff that you would never see just traversing out by yourselves. The beautiful wild that you can see up in Canada is just unmatched by anything else. While I have seen my fair share of wildlife and crazy things I can talk about, aggressively chasing off cars in a parking lot, and even stumbling across a mother grizzly bear and her three cubs, I've also seen things that I can't explain with any reasoning or logic, no matter how much I try and think about them or debate them with facts. According to science, things that my father and I saw just shouldn't plainly exist. Simple as that. My father and I have both seen our fair share of UFOs, together mainly. And in fact, the entire Northern Canada region is littered with them, constantly. So again, I'm not a stranger to witnessing things that shouldn't exist per se. But the sighting I'm going to share with you, I really have no words or explanation for. And maybe you do. We were on the northern bank, watching the lake, when about 50 to 70 yards away, this tall, black, canid humanoid figure. It feels so weird saying that, but that's the only description I have for you. Comes walking out of the forest, walking at a standard pace, and just continues walking straight into the water until this thing was fully submerged. We didn't see any bubbles. We didn't even see it flinch or any sort of extra movement as soon as it went into the water. It's literally like it just walked headfirst into the water with no questions asked. I can't remember the film, but it reminded me of a scene in a movie where a dad is set to drown himself, and so he just casually walks into a pond just like that until his head is fully submerged and he drowns. Except this was similar and not quite the same thing. My dad and I are both in shock and look at each other and we both yell at each other. Did you just see that? What was that thing? While we got a good look at it from far away, we couldn't see the crucial details because of how far it was away. But this thing didn't seem to notice us, as far as we can tell. It never once glanced over in our direction, or in any of its directions to be exact. And once it fully submerged into the water, we saw no signs that it was still alive, no air bubbles, and it certainly did not resubmerge anytime soon. Because the area of the bank we were on, there's really nowhere it could have resurfaced without us seeing it, and it didn't. So not only were my father and I weirded out by what we saw, but we couldn't even fathom what it is that we saw. After we see it submerge, I'm scanning where it went in, I'm scanning the bank, and my father is scanning out in the lake to see if he could see it swimming. And we couldn't. It's almost as if this thing, whatever it was that fully walked in and submerged itself, was just walking casually, strolling along the bottom of the lake. What we saw was a tall, black figure, and it looked to be like it kind of had a dog head. It was pitch black, but we saw two large pointed ears and a snout. The body that the head was on looked just like a man, to the T, a relatively lean man, no doubt, that was muscly, but human legs, human arms, didn't see any claws or anything weird, nothing disproportionate. It's as if somebody took a dog head and stuck it right on a human body. And even though this figure was an estimated 50 to 70 yards away, it was pitch black. We couldn't see any details of this thing that would allow us to better identify what it is that we saw. Was it an animal? Or was it a person? Or was this a thing? My father is pretty convinced that it is some form of an alien, since we've seen so many UFO sightings and just weird shapes and figures in the sky. His take on it is that there is such a thing as humanoid canid aliens, and that's exactly what we saw. And the reason it was walking under the water was to walk to its ship that is also submerged under the water. And the reason it could submerge fully without having to breathe is because it's clearly an alien life form. It can traverse our time and space like no other, which means materialism isn't a thing. With how far out there my dad can get, I can't argue. I mean, he does make a good point. Personally, I don't believe it was an alien, 
but I don't have an explanation at all for what happened, what we saw, or why it did what it did, or why we continue to see all the lights and strange things in the sky that we do every time we're up here in the northern Canada area. It seems like the more desolate wilderness you get into, the more strange things happen. I don't know if those two things have any correlation with each other. I've had some really close friends of mine tell me some hair-raising strange things that they've experienced themselves out in the northern regions of the wilderness in Canada. But nothing as specific as this. It was more just hearing weird sounds, like howling noises, and other strange things that they couldn't attribute it to a specific animal. I don't claim to know all the answers because, frankly, I don't have any answers. The only thing I have is a sighting that I can't quite explain. In hopes of sharing this with you, maybe you can give me some answers and hopefully shed some light onto what me and my father saw that day. Was it an alien or was it something else? There's certain places when you're traveling that you pass through that you just think to yourself, I will never come back here ever again. The first place off the top of my mind is Bear Creek, Montana. That place is somewhere I will never come back to. So the population is literally like 50 or 60 people. It's tiny and there's practically nobody in Montana as it is. So the population count really shouldn't come off as a surprise. But that's not why I'm telling you I will never come back there. That whole place is just creepy. Geographically, there is canyons all around that little tiny town, if you want to call it that. My girlfriend and I, on a crossroad trip, spent about half the day, or maybe it was more like an entire day, driving through this whole area of Montana. Again, filled with canyons, but what we heard was more so right around this area. It was either right before or right after, since I don't exactly remember the city limits. I would like to think these howls, or whatever you want to call them, came from the canyon nearby, but we can't be certain because it's hard to tell with the way sound travels. My girlfriend and I heard the most aggressive screaming that we've ever heard. It sounded like it came from something not human. It almost sounded like a monster, a howl between a wolf and some sort of beast. Montana is already pretty much cowboy country and fairly desolate, so something like this wouldn't surprise me all too much if monsters were real and they decided to live around these areas. The noises we were hearing terrified us inside our tiny car with the windows rolled down and the radio playing softly in the background. At one point or another, we pulled over and just quietly listened to the outside. And the roaring, I guess you would call it, still continued on for minutes afterwards. It wasn't one long continuous growl or scream. It was a segment of screams. They didn't have any sort of pattern to them, like you would think. So no, it wasn't a form of communication. It was just random howling and screaming. If I could give you the best description I can, take when a mountain lion screams, like when they make that sound like a woman being murdered, and then combine that with a wolf howl, and then somebody angrily screaming. Combine those three things, distort it just a little bit, like some of those old AM radios, how they have a little bit of that crackling distortion, and then put that through a mega speaker at an insane dB volume. That's not exactly what we heard, but in my mind, that comes pretty close to what it was. It scared my girlfriend and I pretty bad. Whatever was making that noise had to be a huge monster, assuming it was a monster. I don't know any animal in the North American wilderness that makes that kind of cry, or is that loud. Bears don't scream like that. Mountain lion don't even scream like that. And they don't sound like that, which leaves the only other predator, a wolf. And a wolf doesn't sound anything like that. And again, none of those three animals even make a sound that loud let alone sounding exactly like that. Because my girlfriend and I sat there in the car, debating and crossing off the list what it could be and what it couldn't be, and we both came to the same conclusion. There is no known animal that we are aware of that makes a sound that exactly matched what we heard. For the rest of the state of Montana, it was beautiful, and we saw a lot of amazing sights, like tons of wild horses and just, they don't call it the big sky country for no reason. 
but there is just something genuinely messed up about that region of Montana that we will never travel through again. I wanted to tell you about my experience last summer. I'm fortunate enough to have a larger house and a little bit of land to go with it, so I'm kind of an outdoor freak. Having a very successful career has allowed me to have multiple trailers and a work truck as necessary. In one of the trailers, I keep my two dogs, a Rottweiler German Shepherd mix named Yogi and my other dog, Ralph, who's an Irish Wolfhound, two total sweethearts. I have a really nice area set up for them and plenty of food and water. They really enjoyed it in there. They usually just spend a lot of time sleeping and lounging around, but I only keep them in there when I'm gone. Whatever happened that night, whatever thing came, I believe killed my dogs and took them. This evening I was taking my woman out to dinner and a movie, and we ended up going out to the bar for a couple of beers afterward. We came back to the house really late. It was well after midnight since we left the bar around 10. As I'm pulling up the street to get to my house, I look to see some distorted torn metal on the top of one of my trailers. What the? My girlfriend actually pointed it out first and immediately said that somebody had broken in. I pulled my truck over immediately and ran up my driveway. It was worse than I thought. There were pieces and chunks of torn up metal with blood on them lying on the ground. It looked like metal pieces of a car that would fly off in the head-to-head -head collision. Mangled, bent, and destroyed. I was near on having a panic attack when I realized I didn't hear my dogs. I quickly unlocked the door and flung it open, and my heart stopped in my stomach. My dogs were nowhere to be found, but there was blood and fur everywhere on the floor, along with more pieces of bloody, shredded up metal. It reeked like wet dog, blood, and death. I look up and there's a gaping hole in my ceiling, easily large enough for Andre the Giant to fit through. It was a mess. I had a mental breakdown. My girlfriend was freaking the hell out, crying hysterically. So I called the police and told them that there was a break-in and my dogs went missing. I was panicking so hard on the phone with the 911 operator, she could hardly understand me. A cop came pretty quickly and I showed him what happened in my trailer and told him I had no idea what happened. I just don't understand why there's no signs of my dogs anywhere, just tufts of their fur and blood. I didn't even know if it was their blood. What the hell kind of animal is strong enough to tear into a trailer, grab two large dogs, kill them, and eat them, and then leave? If that is what happened, I didn't know. I'll never forget the look on his face when he took in the scenery inside the trailer. He went pale and started acting really nervous. He was stuttering and being really fidgety and told me he needed to step away real quick and make a quick phone call. He was on the phone for about 10 minutes when he comes back to tell me he's going to take some information down, but it was probably just a bear who broke in and was hungry. I flipped out on him, telling him what kind of bear rips through the top part of a metal trailer and devours two large-sized dogs. He never gave me a direct answer, just ended things with, I'm just going to write this down as a bear attack and you need to be careful next time, bullshit. I never heard anything else from the police department. His tone and demeanor scared me when he was taking down notes. It's like he knew something and he kept telling me it was just a bear and that I shouldn't worry. Although he and I both seemed to clearly understand, it was impossible for a bear to have done this magnitude of damage. I didn't get any sleep that night, or for the next few. I had just got rid of the trailer within a week and had it scrapped. I did put up flyers though hoping somewhere my dogs would show up, but they never did. It was pretty traumatizing what happened to me. I'll never forget it. What I still don't understand is with that kind of carnage, the police would have, should have done more. I don't know what to think. It was a long time ago, but I'm pretty sure I and my dad found a dead juvenile dogman in our barn. It was in the winter time and we had two barns on our property. One which my father would use and 
another one on the far side of the property that was a little more out of shape. It desperately needed a new paint job and a lot of other things done to it. My father really never got around to it, so he just used it as storage and infrequently visited it. Our property was shaped more like a big rectangle. We had thick timber and fur all around our property line, except for the front which sloped down to a dirt road that rounded around our house, followed by more clear land. The barn that acted as a large storage shed was a few hundred yards away from the house, near the wood line, kind of tucked away in the corner of the property. The other barn, our shed, chicken coop, was all on the other side of the property. This left us with really no reason to go out that way, unless my dad needed some specific things from the other barn. Sorry, I have to lay out the details for you first. So, this was in the winter time, and I was helping my dad out in the storage barn, and he was clearing a bunch of old hay, because he was going to set one of his cars in there. It had been a brutally cold winter, lots of snow and lots of ice. As we're clearing out the hay, we end up finding this thing. I don't know what you would call it. A dogman, I guess. It must have tried to find warmth in the old hay, and froze to death, I'm guessing. I'm not really sure how it died. That's just based on what I know now. As a kid, it really freaked me out. My dad just thought it was some strange animal, but it looked freaky. This thing looked to be the size of a child, but slightly larger than I. I was 8 years old at the time, and it was very humanoid looking. It was curled up in the fetal position. It had black leathery skin and black matted fur all over its back. It had human-like hands with long black claws on the ends of each finger. The feet were dog-like, and the legs had hocks in them, just like a dog did. It had a wolf-looking face that looked like it was in anguish when it died. Its muzzle was the scariest thing about it at the time. It had long rows of razor-bladed teeth that kind of curled backward a little bit. They were sharp. Its eyes had already rotted out, and it was much frailer than I would have expected. If this thing truly matches with any of the living descriptions of a creature of similar features, I would imagine it to be quite muscular. It wasn't uncommon for us to find dead animals like that in our barn that would either eat poison or freeze from the winter, but I had no idea what we were looking at. I kept asking my father what it was, and he just kept telling me to bury it. It will always stick with me for as long as I can remember. Ten years ago, I worked as a security guard to a rather popular apple orchard in the state of Massachusetts. I won't name the name of the orchard, but it is a very popular one. I ended up quitting my security job because of this incident. I had already been there for a few months when this happened, so I was doing my nightly routine. I was patrolling the west area of the orchard when I thought my eyes were playing tricks on me. I kept seeing this large shape dart between the trees in the orchard. I thought somebody was trying to sneak around, so I quickly investigated and shone my light into the orchard. I didn't see anything at first, but then I thought I saw a shape that didn't look like it was supposed to be there. I started walking closer, saying out loud, I'm coming to you. I know you're there. I take about another two to three steps, and this huge canine-like shape takes off bolting through the orchard. It was so loud, it sounded like ten gorillas crashing through the woods, destroying several of the apple trees in the process. It all happened so fast that I wasn't able to get a great look at it, other than I knew I wanted to be as far away from that thing as possible. I was telling my boss about it, and even he thought I was just making it up. It scared the hell out of me. I think mainly because it was so huge, just such a massive shape. Whatever it was had to have been easily 500 plus pounds, and looked like it was crouching down. As it took off, I did get a decent view of the back, and could see what looked like cropped ears on top of his head, and a little bit of a side profile on the muzzle. I work for a county cleanup crew in Mississippi. I won't say which county because my name is known around here and I don't want to receive any flack for telling you guys this. I do many different things for the county, but I've gone on the cleanup crew a few times. Let me explain to you what I mean by the cleanup crew. 
I'll go through some of the more rural highways and areas with a lot of critter traffic and clean up roadkill. Whole lot more to say than that. One day, I was doing my route by myself. It was a long highway that really goes out there in the country. This area is notorious for roadkill, such as squirrels and skunks. Deer a lot of times too, but not as much. We get a lot of other critters like possums and raccoons, but they're all amongst the bunch. In my time doing this, I've come across several carcasses of deer that are torn to pieces. I don't mean just ripped open and eaten. I'm talking literally ripped open and guts torn out and thrown everywhere. It's a mess. The only meat that is being eaten is by the flies and maggots. What I think happens is that some of these deer get hit by trucks and get knocked onto the side of the road, and then perhaps some large bear or other predator comes and does this to the deer. Only problem is what kind of predator doesn't eat the meat, but instead rips up the carcass. Well, I would find that out in just a few months. I was driving home and it was in the evening time, so it was already dark. I actually lived not too far away from some of the highways I'm assigned to clean up. Upon coming up a rather large hill was a dead deer in the other lane of the road, as well as this monstrous wolf-looking person or thing, and it was crouched down, just like a person would. It was ripping the meat off the bone. I came upon the hill saw the scene in front of me, but didn't slow down or speed up. I just kept driving, and I took it in all at once. Whatever this animal was never looked up at me or cared to notice me, but in the three seconds I saw everything that I did, it was ripping the skin off the carcass and had what appeared to be blood all over its hands and chest. I didn't really see the face, but it looked very coyote-like. It was gray-looking and slender. It wasn't huge, but... It looked to be about as big as me and you. I have never quite heard of an animal like this, but I dismissed it and kept driving. It wasn't until later on that I pieced it together once I found another deer carcass that looks like the same thing and wondered if it was from this animal. I had begun asking around my area if anybody had seen a creature like the one I saw and, of course, I was either laughed at or told I was crazy. That's when I knew I was onto something. Whatever I saw didn't scare me, but it did intrigue me because I didn't know those kinds of things can exist. It certainly seems like it would possess incredible killing power. I was curious. I really wanted to do some heavy research and dig up what I could. Unfortunately, not a lot turned up, but then I stumbled upon the keyword dogman and started reading encounter after encounter and stories. I've heard everything from the bodybuilder, pitch black looking dogman, to the more hyena looking dogman, to even the coyote skinny kind of dogman. The whole phenomenon is really interesting and I'm not sure if these creatures are regional or what the deal is, but now it does make sense and I do believe I saw one of these things. Before I tell you the story, I would like to give you a little background information on me and the situation. I'm 39, and I have a wife, Taylor, who is 32. We have been married for almost 10 years now, and I have grown extremely close with her family. Particularly, her grandmother, Verla, who just passed away last year. Her grandmother was a very interesting character, had a very successful business and plentiful amounts of wealth. She was quite the businesswoman from what I heard from her colleagues. Anyway, she owned a very large house that was plantation styled in northern Kentucky. This huge plot of land featured acres and acres, as well as a barn and other stuff on the property. I mean, this is a huge house we're talking about. Maybe close to a mansion size? I don't know. We've known about it, but we've never actually been out there ourselves till this last year to see the house. We live in Northern California, and she would always come and visit us, so we never really had a reason to go out there. She was very close with my wife, and I as well, and of course from her passing it was extremely difficult for both of us. She did leave a will, and it turns out that she actually left the house and her property to my wife in the will. We were astonished that she would do this, but she did leave huge sums of money for some of my wife's brothers and sisters. We flew out to Kentucky 
to check the place out since it was now in my wife's name. I know she was really wishy-washy about it, but I'm not sure she wanted to really go through with it. I thought about selling it, but she also thought about keeping it and us moving into it. It all depended on what the property looked like and how much work was going to be needed. Knowing Verla, she had the place pretty spot on and kept up on things really great. She didn't have any grandkids or anything like that, so the house stayed pretty immaculate. She was always kind of a clean freak though, even when she would come over. So, we get to Northern Kentucky and we go to check out this house. She lived pretty secluded. You had to take this long two-lane road and then onto this long dirt gravel road that would eventually lead you to her property. Her property itself was beautiful with what I can only describe as big rolling pastures that went on and on with the Kentucky wilderness all around. It was utterly breathtaking. She even had an older well on the property. The house itself was massive and had five or so bedrooms and three bathrooms and a couple of additional bedrooms used for stuff, I guess. An attic and a basement were also included and other various rooms that weren't being used or used to store only items. Again, there was a lot of rooms. It was a beautiful older home and had a nice big wood stove in the kitchen that was used primarily for heating and cooking. I had big ideas in my head all ready to flip this thing and make a killing since I had no desire to want to live in it. From we could tell right away that the house was in fairly good shape. My wife was very impressed with the house but came to the same conclusion that maybe we should try and sell it versus abandoning our jobs back at home. We sat outside on the massive wraparound porch talking about our plans and what we wanted to do. This was in the evening time and at some point during our conversation we began to hear strange vocalizations off in the woods next to us. My wife and I would exchange glances every time we heard these. They began to get more and more disturbing and strange. I'm no wildlife expert, but I'm pretty sure I've never heard an animal noise quite like this. It was like a guttural howl. It sounded so low and whatever made the sound had to have quite the set of lungs. Then we would hear this really low growling sound. It was all around the woods around us. It made us uncomfortable, but it wasn't too out of control. The noise had stopped after a while and we quickly forgot about it. We decided to do one more walk around the house just to get a better feel for things on the outside. It was really starting to get dusk, so we weren't planning on staying too much longer. My wife began to notice weird things around the sides of the house. Huge tracks going back and forth around the house. Canine tracks specifically. Big ones. As she began to notice more and more, there was a bunch of them. This was weird because Verla was not an animal person at all, and in fact she was actually allergic to most pets, including cats and dogs. She lived pretty remotely, so we thought it was strange. There were also no neighbors within miles of her, so there's no reason any dogs at all should have been around her property, but there were multiple tracks and multiple sets of these prints. That's when my wife discovered that several of the basement windows had been broken all around the house. Where the windows were broken, there were a lot of these big canine tracks walking off into this spot. We both looked at each other. Is some big dog breaking into my wife's dead grandmother's house? I don't remember if I said it, but it was dusk at this point and so it was starting to get darker and darker. I don't know if it was the sheer abnormality of the situation that caused our skin to crawl, but I could have sworn in that moment things around us got quiet. I began to feel really on edge and I could tell my wife began to feel uncomfortable as well. I told her we'll just come back in the morning and look a little further. Up to this point we had only done a quick walkthrough of the house. We didn't thoroughly search or anything. This will make sense in a second. So we'd go back that night and would come back the following morning. Things seemed fairly normal. There's no noise from the woods and all seems alive and well. Well, no weird noises, but we heard nature of course. We looked onto the house and decided to search a little more thoroughly. If we were going to sell this thing, 
we wanted to make sure there wasn't anything out of place or anything cosmetically that we needed to fix. From the previous day, the broken windows in the basement could prove to be a problem, so we wanted to get down there and see what we could do to fix them. The great thing is that if we were to sell this place, we can really make a lot of money because it was such a beautiful piece of land. Thank you, Lord, that Verla did such an amazing job at keeping up on her house. We headed on down to the kitchen and into the basement, into a very massive basement, mind you. As soon as we opened the door, we're hit in the face with this stench of wet dog and urine. It's so thick it almost knocked us back on our feet. I remember my wife saying, Oh, God, as she's covering her face with her arm and walking down the stairs. Because it was an older house, the light to the basement was at the very bottom, so she just used her phone light to navigate down the stairs. I had followed closely behind her. Once we got to the bottom and turned the light on, we could see that the basement actually had a lot of room. There's the main basement room that we were in, and off to our left was a small room that looks like it could have been a wine cellar at some point. It had no windows in there. Off to our right was another small little hallway area that had a washer and dryer, and beyond that another room. The window in the room we were currently in was smashed inward, like something broken in. We didn't see any traces of hair or anything that would lead to somebody breaking in, but the stench of wet dog and urine was really bad. My wife and I chalked it up to some animal, probably a dog breaking in here and sleeping down here, even though it didn't add up at all with the tracks outside. It felt odd to even think about that because dogs don't act like that, nor do they behave in such a bizarre manner. The other weird thing was the basement windows were larger, but they were still about a seven foot drop from the window to the ground. So how is the dog, if that's what it was, getting in and out of the basement? To our knowledge, nobody had been over at this house since she had died, which was about five weeks prior. This had to have been recent. We searched the other room with the window to see if there was anything we could find, and it was just more broken glass and that horrible, horrible stench. It gets even more weird, though. After leaving the basement and spending more time looking throughout the house, I noticed that there was salt along every doorway upstairs and sage in every bedroom. I didn't really notice this before because I didn't take the time to pay attention, but it immediately struck me as weird. I'm no expert, but aren't lining doorways with salt and burning sage a way to ward off evil spirits? From what we knew, Verla was a hardcore atheist and thought everything of the spiritual manner was childish and make-believe. Why would she have this in her house? Plus the tracks outside the house and the weird noises during the day before the woods getting quiet. It was just too weird, and so we decided to call it a day and maybe get a realtor involved in helping us sell the place. I remember when we left, or I should say as we were leaving the house, I remember feeling very uncomfortable. On the drive back to the hotel, I was asking my wife if maybe Verla knew if there was the possibility of a poltergeist being in the house. But that doesn't explain the basement windows being busted inwards, like something had broken in and was living down there. Maybe they were two separate problems. I don't know, but it was weird. She agreed that the house kind of gave her weird vibes too, and not the good kind. The following day, we called up a local realtor and explained our situation, and she happily agreed to help us sell the house. We wanted her to go check out the place and get her opinion so we scheduled the following day for her to come out with us and check the house out. We were supposed to be at the house that morning by 11 a.m., and we ended up getting stuck in traffic by about 20 minutes or so. So we're on our way there, I think it was around 11.15, and we get a phone call from the realtor. She sounded panicked and said we're going to have to find somebody else to help sell the house. She told us and asked us if we're aware that a big black dog was running around outside the house and ran after her to attack her. It scared her so bad. My wife and I were both thoroughly confused at what she was saying, but she was frantic and ended the call. Luckily, my wife's sister's husband was an investor and dealt with rental properties more than anything else. 
We got in touch with him and asked if he would be interested in helping us sell the house and splitting the profit since my wife owned it now. He happily agreed and flew out to meet us. We had lunch, talked about the house and how much we were planning on selling it for. He offered to go check out the place and give us a good appraisal on the property. We trusted his judgment well since he knew the real estate game pretty thoroughly. We also informed them that a realtor that we just tried to work with was spooked off the property by some dog or so, so we warned him of that. He chuckled and went on his way. Well, we get a phone call from him about three hours after lunch, and the only thing he told us was that he's not helping us sell the house, that we're on our own. My wife and I are furious at this point and demand answers, but he refused to answer any questions and just said he's never going anywhere near that house again and that we need to stay away from it too. Exhausted, frustrated, and confused, we had no idea what the hell to do. The whole house selling process was very confusing and we were very new to it. We needed help, but everybody seemed to keep giving up on us, so my wife just decided to hold on to the house for a little bit longer and determine later on how we're gonna sell the damn thing. My wife still is holding on to that property and we've gone back a couple of times with some crazy things happening to us. Although, because there's so many things that happened, I'm not going to write it all out in one email, so I may send you more of that later. But for now, this is the gist of our situation with this house. We can't get rid of it, and there's some sort of crazy things going on with that property. I was busy doing dishes late one night when I happened to glance at my window right above my kitchen sink. I had to adjust my eyes and squint at first because I wasn't exactly sure what I was seeing. Once I was able to make out what it was, the sight before me was truly terrifying and frightening. I thought it was a man at first, except he looked like a dog, had a long snout and pointed ears. They reminded me of a German Shepherd's ears, and I had a hard time understanding what I was looking at. But then, my eyes continued to observe the rest of its body. It had a torso like a man, with human-looking arms and legs. This thing was covered in hair or fur all over its body, and it appeared to be a dark brown or black color. It was one leg stepping over our old wooden fence with what appeared to be a dead cat in its arm. As soon as it lifts its leg over the fence, it quickly turned its head back toward the direction it was coming from, as if to make sure it wasn't being seen. I got goosebumps. Bad. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. As soon as it lifted its leg over the fence, it quickly lifted up the other leg and was gone in a flash. I threw the dishes down and ran to go wake up my wife to let her know what I had seen. She said to me in a groggy state that I shouldn't stay up late anymore and do dishes because clearly I was seeing things. I still don't quite understand what it is that I saw, even though my wife doesn't believe me. I've looked on Google to see if I can find any images close to what I saw, and I guess it's a Rougarou. I believe that is French for werewolf although I'm pretty sure that werewolves are fictional. But I can't deny what I saw that night, so I really don't know what it was. It was so scary and so human-like. The only dog-like thing about it was that it was covered in fur and that it had a large head of a dog. I'm convinced that I saw a wolfman of some kind. I'm just thankful that it never turned back and looked at me. If it wasn't for the full moon shining at the right place during the right time, and having virtually no clouds, and having not looked up when I did, I would have never ever known it was there. It was maybe only 30 to 40 feet away from the window. I used to live in a neighborhood in eastern Pennsylvania for about 12 and a half years. Pennsylvania is the witchcraft capital of the world, so all sorts of freaky stuff goes on. For the record, this neighborhood was a little bit smaller. We all kind of knew each other. I lived in that neighborhood on and off for 12 years, but we had what we'd like to call the neighborhood creeper. We all kept tabs on what this thing was, but we believe it was some sort of monster. Look, 
I know that sounds silly coming right off the bat, but let me explain. This creature would steal our cats and dogs, and it tried to break into our houses. Only sometimes, though. It wasn't around all the time, and there never seemed to be a rhyme or reason for it showing up. But it was primarily active during the early morning hours and at nighttime. It would come and go, no matter what season or month. Unfortunately, I got the chance to see this thing nearly face to face through my window. It had a very scary wolf-like face, pointed ears, and very human-like hands, but they were pressed up against the glass, so I couldn't see them as much as I would want to, or not want to. Judging by the size of this animal, it could have very easily just pushed my window through and gotten to me, but it didn't. It was like it was reminding me that I was its prey, and it wanted to keep me in my cage until it was ready to feast. I know deep down that this thing could catch me and put me out of my house and eat me if it wanted to. There is a very old sweet lady that lived just a few houses down from me. God rest her soul. She passed away a few years before I moved out, but she described it as looking like a werewolf. She said it was black and gray in color and had very large teeth. She said it would always steal her cats and eat them. She was one of those elderly ladies that kind of let it go with having cats. I mean, her cats were always having kittens and having more and more kittens. She never really took care of them, and it really got out of hand. I guess you can say she was the crazy old cat lady, but she wasn't a crazy lady, she was actually a very sweet loving lady. Anyway, maybe that's one of the reasons why this thing came around. There was free food supply. I'm not exactly sure. Most people in the neighborhood were terrified from what I recall, and nobody tried shooting at it or calling the cops because, come on, what are they going to do? Last I heard when I moved out, there were still activity because I still keep in contact with some of my neighbors. I had developed close relationships with some of them, especially the ones close to me, and to my knowledge, this thing still lurks around the neighborhood from time to time. To answer some of your questions, to my knowledge, it has never broken into anybody's house, although it has attempted. It's never attacked or hurt anybody, other than household pets. But it has scared the pants off many. The neighborhood kind of goes down on an unofficial lockdown at night, and you really don't see anybody out after dark. It's strange because you can go a few neighborhoods over, and people are out walking their dogs at night. But in the evening, not in this neighborhood, I'm glad to have been gone, and honestly, I have no desire to ever return. I was up in the Pacific Northwest and hunting during doe season. I had my tree stand all set up, and I got up there early as I could, waiting for deer. Luckily for me, I was on a friend's property, in which he owned about 30 plus acres. I much preferred hunting on private property, so I didn't have to try and compete with a kill. What happened to me this day made me take a hiatus from deer hunting. So I'm sitting there, waiting in the stand, and I hear something big coming at me in the woods. My first instinct was that it was maybe a large buck, just because of the large sounds and how fast it was traveling. I looked off in the distance where the noise was coming from and just out of the trees came this massive wolf-looking creature on all fours that just seemed to be passing by. It walked off up into the small hill and vanished again in the trees. I was speechless. I didn't know creatures like that existed out here in the woods of Oregon and decided it was time to hang things up for a while. Not my story, but a friend's information that I am sharing I grew up and lived in Colorado for a long time before moving out of state. I have several close friends that are Arapaho and have a lot of stories about encounters with creatures they dealt with years back. Not they specifically, stories passed down from their tribe. I don't know if there are any other major native tribes other than the Arapaho that primarily lived in the Colorado region, but it's the only ones I'm aware of. Many probably know that the Rocky Mountains hold a lot of mysteries. Some of the stories that were shared with me was information dating back to the early 19 and 1800s. Fur trappers and tribesmen alike 
were captured and devoured alive by these werewolf creatures. I can't remember what the Arapaho called them, but they had a name for these things. Trying not to convolute the situation, these same werewolf-like creatures would wage war with these other beings that we know called Bigfoot. The Arapaho also had a name for them, but I can't remember that either. These werewolf creatures would storm into the villages at night, steal children and smaller little kids. They were stealing these little children to eat. They would send the tribe warriors out to go hunt these creatures down, and when the tribesmen would find them, or what was left of them, it was just bones, far, far away, in the nest of those creatures. Many tribesmen and fur trappers alike died at the hands of these beings. Bow and arrows and muzzle loaders were no match for a nine-foot-tall beast of the night with superhuman strength. Going back to the werewolf creature waging war with Bigfoot-like creatures, it was believed by my friend's tribe that they were waging war over who got to eat and prey upon the tribe. Many of the tribe's fiercest warriors at the time witnessed the battles between these two creatures, and oftentimes would result in either both creatures dying or leaving the battle severely injured. The creatures, not the warriors. My friend told me that his tribe describes these creatures as much taller and larger than some of their greatest warriors, and gray to dark gray in color. The Bigfoot-like beings of the tribe were talked about were also very hostile, and would come to capture and steal their women and children at night as well. It was a dangerous environment, and a constant territorial war between the Arapaho, Bigfoot, and Dogman. There are different sectors of the Arapaho tribe, and one particular tribe, or village, moved around in fear that these creatures would keep stalking them. It became a relentless pursuit, until the village was successful in killing a small handful of these werewolf creatures severing their heads and putting them on spears, placing them all outside the village to ward off other dangers. Their claim was that these creatures lived in this large underground den deep in the mountain's side that they would drag the captured children, women, and tribesmen to and eat them. From what I was told, this den was never expunged because they couldn't match the firepower of these creatures, only ward them off from their own territory which means that this den is probably alive and well today, and is still very active from the sounds of all the other dogmen encounters in the state. I'm sure it is one of the many dens. Just the thought of that sends shivers down my spine. There's a couple times that tribesmen had ventured into this same den when there were no other dogmen in it, mainly during the day, and would find tons upon tons of human bones and skulls. I thought you might find these stories interesting, Feel free to share them with your audience if you would like to. One night, I got up from sleep and was leaving my bedroom to go get some water downstairs. I saw something behind the curtains in my living room that looked big and black. I could see the shape and it resembled a strange werewolf silhouette standing close by the door when suddenly it turned onto its hands on all fours and ran off towards my neighbor's house in the opposite direction. I was scared out of my mind just seeing this tall thing right outside my house. My curtains are so thin and the moon cast a perfect silhouette of this thing. I wanted to scream my lungs out. My neighbor is a strange guy who has been a paranormal researcher for years. I have never taken him seriously, but maybe I should. Although I don't think he will ever believe me if I told him a werewolf charged at his house. But there is no denying this creature really exists, and it scared the hell out of me. The next day, while I was walking around the neighborhood, I saw strange shadows lurking around during my night walk. Gave me the creeps, so I came home early. I couldn't help but shake the feeling that these things are real. After I went back home, I kept thinking about it more and more, and finally said to myself, Did... Did I see a werewolf last night? And I went online to research it. There is a whole community of people online who share the same beliefs of having an actual werewolf sighting, which surprised me. A lot of people that claim they saw them, with having near accurate descriptions as to what I saw that night. Now, there are so many places online where people like to talk about their encounters. 
Vitkundev's forum, website. I know about the North American Dogman Project, your channel. There's so many. There's just something about watching a Dogman encounter on YouTube now that feels so validating. I feel like I'm not crazy. I know I may be older and getting gray, but I'm not insane. These things are real. <laughs>